We are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, if this is your first time on our podcast, we are Movie Versus Film, a film education and movie review channel. My name is Robert Bellissimo. We have a very special guest today, a man who needs no introduction, as far as, <laughs> as, far as I'm concerned. Uh, Canada Zone, the host of Pop Life on CTV, and the film critic and author of many books on pop culture, Richard Krauss. Richard, thanks so much again for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm just turning off my mail so it doesn't have an annoying pinging sound the whole time. Oh, talking. no problem. There we go. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I wanted to go back to your to your early life because uh, mm. I've heard you say that you feel you know you will really have you are living your dream that you've really been able to live your dreams. Did your dream start because you you know you do so just wanting to be on the radio and it evolved from there? Uh, kind of. I mean, I think I, I grew up in a very small town uh, in a very small province uh, in Liverpool, Nova Scotia. And, you know, the one thing that we had uh, was a giant movie theater about a four minute walk from my house. And I practically grew up in there, the Astor Theater. Uh, we also had a radio station that uh, was uh, pervasive and that you couldn't go anywhere uh, in the southern part of Nova Scotia without hearing CKBW radio. And right. I had an idea that I wanted to work there. The thing about having those kinds of ideas and dreams though, is that I didn't know anyone who had ever been on the radio. I always wanted to write. I didn't know anyone who was a writer in high school. They were suggesting that, you know, I take over my father's business. Don't worry about being a writer. No yeah. one's ever going to want to read anything that you write. And so there was not a lot of encouragement along that way. So I, I started doing then um, what I still do today, which is create my own opportunities. I just went to CKBW as a kid with no training uh, and said, I'd like to be on the radio, please. Can you help me? And it took a long time to worm my way in there, but I eventually did. And I learned a lot. I got fired within a year and rightfully so. I was not good at the job, uh, but they gave me a start and they more importantly uh, gave me the idea that it was possible. It was possible that the, that if you asked somebody would say, you know what, let's give that kid a chance. And I always think of Bob McLaren, who was the guy that hired me there. And the lesson that he taught me, which was probably the most important lesson in my, I suppose, broadcasting and writing career. Uh, it, and that is simply that people want to hear stories about people. When I was on the radio, that first go around, I was all about facts and figures. I'd play a song by the Rolling Stones and I'd say, well, you know, they had three number one hit, whatever it was. I would have the data and it was just spewing that stuff out. And I thought I was doing such a great job. And then as I was being let go, uh, he told me, he said, you know, people don't care about that stuff so much. What they care about is hearing about people. And I have taken that lesson with me uh, through everything that I've done. Uh, and the stories that appeal to me are stories about people that uh, really sort of get under their skin a little bit. Uh, the stories that I'd like to write, the stories that I tell on the radio and the people I speak to on radio and television, uh, I try and get down into uh, who they are, not so much what they do. Right. And I, I really wanted to get into uh, how you, you, you built um, the abilities and confidence with that. But first, when you got fired at 16, <laughs> Like, did that just rattle your confidence? Did you crawl under uh, your bed and just think, I can't do this? Or how, or did you just mm. keep going? I, I just kept going. I mean, gigs were not forthcoming. I moved to Toronto shortly afterwards. And, you know, I, I managed to scour a few writing jobs here and there. I, I, I wrote for whoever would publish me. And sometimes, you know, I'd make... Uh, 50 bucks for an article, which in 1980 or 81 was pretty good money. You could do something with that. Sometimes yeah. I get paid in beer, which again, that's something I could do something with, you know? So I, I just gathered experience along the way, wherever I could get it. And as far as being fired the first time from, from that, I'm sure that in the moment I was kind of devastated by it. Uh, but I always think of Herman Mankiewicz. I don't always think I just, I, I heard this in the, line in the movie Mank, and it has stayed with me, said, I've never not been fired, he says at one point. <laughs> and I think right. that if you work in, in media, as I have for, you know, as long as I have, uh, it's going to happen. 
you're going to get fired. It's not when, or, or it's not if you get fired, it's when you get fired. And right. it is just part of the gig. It's never great. Nobody likes it. Uh, I think I was probably devastated then, but I, you know, have this idea that if you fail five times, you get up to sixth and you keep moving. And that's, I think what kept me going. Right. No, that's, that's great advice. And <laughs> when you say your parent, your father, you know, people are saying, well, you know, father, your father's uh, into your yeah. father's business. When you said to your parents, look, I want to go to Toronto. I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to work in, in radio or in media. What, what was their reaction? Were they supportive or how did uh, that go? A supportive ish. Uh, it, I was met by blank stares because frankly, it wasn't, uh, an idea, uh, that they had an idea of what that actually meant and how you could do it. And it, what my dad died a few years ago, but mm. up until the end of his life, he was 89. Uh, he understood what I was doing when he was physically sitting and watching me on television. Oh, my son's on television. But then he would wonder, what does he do for the other 23 and a half hours a day. He didn't really seem to get that, uh, it was a, a job that was, uh, that, that, that took time. The work he, that goes into that, it. The work that goes into it. Yeah. And, and it just wasn't his thing. He was a guy who had three jobs in his entire life, mm. uh, very much of his generation. And, uh, I have three jobs a week probably that come and go. And so, you know, the, the, the lifestyle, uh, for him was something that he could just never really wrap his head around and, uh, and, you know, supportive and proud. And they were, you know, pleased when, when I started to get successful, but I don't know that it's something that they would have chosen for me. And at, I, when, at the point, cause I know when it was about 1980, you went to Toronto or in the mm -hmm. early eighties. Yep. Uh, and I know you worked in a clothing store, you were a bartender, you mm -hmm. were a, a waiter. And as you said, you did jobs for beer or 50 bucks and, and, mm -hmm. At one point, were you able to just get rid of the side jobs? When were you confident enough to just say, I, I, I can just do this and trust it? It took a long time uh, because there were a few things that were happening. I was working, uh, doing freelance jobs and and at night working in bars. And it was kind of, for me, the, the perfect opportunity to uh, keep myself in, you know, in an apartment and clothes and food and whatever by working at night. Uh, and then I had the days free to take meetings, to do gigs, to write, uh, whatever it was. And it was exhausting. Uh, you know, you're working till three o'clock in the morning, most nights, and then trying to turn it around and do something productive the next day. Um, but for me, that was kind of the only way it was really going to work. And it wasn't until I was, man, I don't even know. I was probably a 30 ish, uh, before I, I left the restaurant business completely. Um, oh. I did it for a long time. And, and the thing is, I liked it. Mm -hmm. I liked it for a good chunk of the time that I did it, but you know, it, it, and I think this may happen to a lot of people who work in bars and restaurants and, and did it for a long time. Uh, you know, it's time to go when you hear the front door open and you roll your eyes and go, ah, <laughs> what does this idiot want? <laughs> That right, is not right. the attitude you want to have. And that's kind of where I got to. It was time to go. And, you know, by that point I was, I was busy enough doing other things. And you were, when you got there, cause your brother was already here, right? Were you, did you was, live with yeah. your brother or, or yeah, what, what was, was he doing? Uh, he, he was going to school and we lived together, uh, in a terrible apartment, uh, on Jarvis <laughs> street. Uh, it was, um, tiny. I slept in the kitchen on a cot, uh, it was cockroach ridden. You'd flick on the light and the floor would move. Oh, I mean, God. it was, it was, yeah. it was, uh, a, 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 every bit as terrible as, as you might imagine an apartment that cost 155 bucks a month to be, I think my share of the rent was 75 or 80 bucks and, uh, the same apartment I noticed, and I won't tell you exactly where it is because, you know, I'm sure it's better now, uh, is now $1,900 a month. <laughs> so it, it's a much different thing. But for me, you know, it was uh, kind of exciting. I was living, you know, right downtown. 
uh, the, the apartment granted was terrible. Uh, but you know, I was uh, wanting to see as much live music as I possibly could and places like the, the Jarvis house and, uh, Larry's hideaway. And you know, those places were literally in my neighborhood. And then if I wanted to hop on a streetcar or take a long walk, I could get to the Alma combo or go to, um, you know, Queen street and go to the, go to, uh, the Beverly Tavern or down to King street and go to, uh, the cabana room and see all the bands that I wanted to see. So the, you know, the inconvenience of coming home to thousands of tiny little roommates, uh, was <laughs> offset by, by the fun, you know, the stuff that was out there, the growing up in a small town, I didn't have the opportunity to indulge myself in live music and, uh, movies whenever I wanted to. And so I took advantage of it here. And, you know, when you, you, uh, it's interesting because a lot of your early life, you know, you were a DJ and even when you're talking about in Toronto, uh, going to these music clubs and movie theaters was mm -hmm. when did the, the, when did your development for, for a love of passion and exploring film really start? Was it after music? Was music your first love? And then it went into well, movies? Or? It, was, it was always kind of there. I mean, I, I, as I said earlier, kind of practically grew up at the Astor Theater in, in Liverpool, Nova Scotia. And it was right. a great uh, way to see everything because back in those days, Nova Scotia was at the, the very far end of the distribution chain. So I would read about uh, Saturday night fever or the Poseidon adventure or something. And then after the rest of the world had seen it, then it would come to my it. little theater. Yeah. And, uh, so, but the theater was open, you know, five days a week, probably I can't remember now, but it was open a lot. And so they had to show something. And so they showed whatever they could lay their hands on. And I went to see whatever they could lay their hands on. And so right. you might see, you know, a, a, a Tar Tartovsky's Stalker with a Bruce Lee movie as a double feature or something like that. Random, random mm. movies, as I recall. Uh, yeah. But it kind of gave me an appreciation for everything. And I loved it all. I mean, I, 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 I absolutely loved it. But the, the idea of uh, movies seemed uh, more distant to me than music. I could go around the corner and see a great band uh, for three bucks. I didn't know how to figure out how to get on a movie set or, you know, move to Los Angeles. So, um, for me, music, uh, was more immediate, but the love of film was always there. Was that partly why you, uh, cause I really have been enjoying your, your books, a hundred, uh, best oh, movies right. that, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you've never seen. Uh, and it, you know, because you saw, uh, such, you know, like you said, either Bruce Lee or Tarkovsky, mm. like such a mixed bag of, uh, of movies. Is that partly why you think you you wrote the book to say, you know, I, I'm not like you mentioned that angry uh, message you got in the introduction yeah. calling you pretentious just for <laughs> saying that uh, <laughs> karate films were your guilty pleasure. Yep. Did you feel you had to tell people, look, I like a lot of different movies. I'm not just some, st you know, stereotypical yeah. critic or. Yeah, no, it wasn't so much that it wasn't so much that it really was uh, paying homage to the movies that I loved. And, mm. you know, movies that I would mention when I was with people and they'd say, I don't know, I've never heard of that. Well, you know, uh, and eventually when it was time to um, put those books together, there's two of them. Uh, there's the hundred best movies you've never seen. And then son of the hundred best movies you've never seen. And I made a list. Yeah, I and got the that list, one too. I love yeah, this one too. <laughs> <laughs> the list was about 300 uh, titles long. And uh, I, I, pick and chose and went through them and found uh, initially the hundred and then went back in and, and chose another hundred. And a lot of them were movies that I saw at the Astor theater. A lot of them were movies that I'd only ever seen on old, you know, Betamax tapes and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but now, you know, obviously it's much easier to find a lot of this stuff, but there was something for me when I was putting those books together, there was still uh, something about the chase you know, of, of finding, of tracking down where you could see them uh, and and having another look at them. That was really exciting to me because, you know, I think for a lot of people, particularly now, as we're in the middle of a pandemic and people are watching things, people are being drawn to things that make them feel good about uh, their choices. So nostalgia is playing, I think, a, a huge role here now in what we're watching when we're at home in lockdown. We want to feel good. We don't maybe want to be surprised as much. So we go back to our old favorites and that's kind of how those books feel to me.
I wanted to talk about uh, a couple of the movies that you recommend because uh, uh, before our interview, just for the audience, uh, I asked Richard to pick a few movies that he suggests. And one of them, uh, well, I, 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 I really enjoy all of them, but the one that I really love is Ace in the Hole. Yeah. Uh, the Billy Wilder and Kirk Douglas starring. Why is that one that you really recommend? I think that one for me works so well and is one that stands out uh, because not only – uh, was it explosive in the moment that it was made when it came out in the 1950s? Uh, and it was a critique of, of how stories were manipulated in the newspaper and how, you know, an aggressive newspaper person could really put a spin on things that would uh, change the reader's perception about it. Uh, it was a sensation there. Some people called it ruthless and cynical in the day, in the moment when it came out. Um, yeah. Others said, oh, like this is actually kind of uh, an interesting look at the, at, the, at the media. And it was an early look at the media. And then if you were to see that movie when it came out and then see it again 10 years later, it's the same story and it's still as impactful and it's still as timely as it was 10 years previous to that cut to 10 years later, 10 years later, 10 years later. Now we're 60, whatever years uh, removed from it. And it's more timely today than it was when it came yeah. out. This is a story that um, I think Billy Wilder with his, uh, sharp eye and and cunning wit and and uh, his ability to really uh, shake things up in terms of the way stories like this were told made a movie that I think we'll be watching in twenty years and going yeah the media is still uh, something that we should question I'm not right. you know I'm not, and I if people say the words fake news to me that is uh, one of the ways that I shut down completely in conversation. Don't love that, but this yeah. is th this movie isn't about fake news. It's about examining how stories are reported, mm -hmm. and uh, it's fascinating. And of course, Kirk Douglas. I mean, this is for me his greatest role. Oh, he's fantastic in it, yeah. and and I really like. I was listening to that podcast you did with Spike Lee, where mm -hmm. about five years ago, with Chi, when he was promoting Chi Rock, and yeah. and he you mentioned uh, the book. Uh, and he goes, oh, I hope an ace in the holes in there. And you said, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is. And he, he you know, he movie. mentioned. Yes, he does. In the face of the crowd, you know, they're like a double feature. Well, the face um, of the crowd is another one that could easily be put, yeah. uh, you know, on this list. Uh, you know, there there are so many films. When you asked me for a list the other day, I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll send over the the titles that I'm thinking of right this second. Right. It might be different today and might be different again tomorrow. Uh, but A Face in the Crowd absolutely is a movie that it should be mm. essential viewing uh, right now, given the last you know four years in the state yeah. of politics in the United States. Uh, this is a, a movie that, again, like uh, Ace in the Hole, is timeless, is brilliant. Uh, and I think it, you know, it boils down to uh, the storytelling and how when you're telling a really interesting and great story, no matter what the, the specifics of it are, if there's a universal uh, thing, message that right. can be taken away from that, that's when you have a timeless classic. Oh, I absolutely agree. And, he, and how he found a way to make it somewhat funny, I don't know. Like even off the top, when you see him with reading the newspaper in a car getting towed, yeah. I just, yeah. You know, just unbelievable. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Billy Wilder has uh, not only was he a great writer, but he was a great visual wit mm. as well. Mm. And the movies, uh, all his movies are just filled with uh, uh, amazing visuals. And that's why I think, again, they stand the test of time. Well-told stories that you can look at over and over again and always find something new. Oh, Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And if anyone uh, wants to see Ace in the Hole, uh, you can get it uh, through the Criterion Collection mm -hmm. as it on both Blu-ray and DVD. It's unfortunately not on the streaming service, uh, the Criterion channel, but I, I I'm sure it uh, will make its way there eventually. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm curious, when when you uh, began to interview uh, people, were you always comfortable in front of the camera or did you have to develop mm -hmm. that? I think you develop it over time. Uh, I was never really uncomfortable, uh, in front of a camera. I often, 
I think probably because I'd worked in radio a fair amount before I started getting like really regular television gigs. Um, I was used to just <laughs> talking into the ether, you know, you sort of talking to yourself right, uh, a right. lot of the time. Into the mic. <laughs> into a mic. And so talking into a camera is not that much different. And mm -hmm. for me, uh, it was about kind of pretending the camera wasn't there. Uh, and, and, and it's the, the oldest cliche in the book, but you want to try and talk to one person. Choose a person who right. may or may not be watching and talk to them. And, mm -hmm. you know, the affectations that come along with a lot of broadcasting don't really appeal to me that much. When I started in radio and and um, and I, maybe to an extent television as well, but I, I wanted to sound like Lloyd Robertson this beautiful baritone voice, or I wanted to uh, have the same kind of delivery as Casey Kasem or these radio guys that I loved, like Charlie Tuna. Back in the old days, and, and maybe people still do it now, but back in the old days, you used to buy air checks. And an air check is a tape that records when your microphone is on. So you introduce a song. As soon as you turn your microphone off, the tape stops. And so what you get uh, at the end of it is just uh, just the talking just your performance. And uh, you can get a four or five hour show and it takes you 20 minutes to listen to it or half an hour to listen to it. Uh, program directors use them to critique your performance. But a lot of the big time DJs, uh, mostly in the US, uh, used to sell them. And so I'd buy them and just pour over them and listen to them and think, how can I do that? How can I, you know, be as good as that? And then I realized that it wasn't about being like Charlie Tuna or Casey Kasem or, you know, Wolfman Jack or whoever it was, Lloyd Robertson. Uh, it was about being myself. And once I understood that stripping away all that affectation uh, was, was, preferable to having a perfectly presented flawless kind of performance that maybe doesn't have a lot of soul to it. Um, I got better gigs, more gigs, and, you know, it continued from there. It reminds me so much just as myself as an actor. I think a lot of actors start that way. You mimic the people that you want to be like, like whether it's Brando or De Niro or Meryl Streep. And then after a while, teachers keep telling you, just be yourself. And eventually, yeah. <laughs> eventually well, I, you I interviewed Lucas Hedges yesterday, and we were talking about his performance in a movie called French Exit, which is out right now. Oh, yeah, with Michelle yeah. Pfeiffer. Yeah, and uh, in it, he, he doesn't do much. Mm. He uh, underplays things. He uh, has a kind of sardonic way of speaking. Uh, he, he mumbles. He gets halfway through sentences. He stops. And, and I asked him about the performance, and he said, you know, you never see – an actor who's just bored with a character on screen. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to throw away all the actorly stuff to kind of, hey, look at me and subvert right. myself into this character completely and um, just let the audience think, I wonder what he's thinking. I wonder why right. he's bored. And I'll tell you, it works. It's a really yeah. lovely performance uh, from, you know, a young guy. He's 23, 4, 5 years old. He's uh, very like, good. Very thoughtful about his choices in film. Yeah, no, I love that. Just to do so little uh, then, you know, translate into doing so much. Well, it feels um, counterintuitive, right? That you, exactly. you also you have to fill the screen and yeah. You don't. Yeah, it's a lot of trust, uh, and and I and I imagine you learn that uh, uh, when you interview people. And just jumping on, you know, you mentioned the advice the uh, gentleman who fired you as a DJ mm -hmm. said. You know, people are interested in hearing about people. How did you uh, get your head around adapting that into interviewing people? Was it simply? I know that you you said you know when you were bartending that you really learned how to how to listen, how to get stories out of people. Would you say that was your main training or did you take any classes about that or how did that uh, evolve? I've read a lot of books about it and and there are enormous amounts of books uh, mm. out there and as they're now online. There's an enormous amount yeah. of, of information about there about how to interview people. And, you know, really my, it, it, people ask me about it. I would say, don't make the questions too long and listen. Right. And I mean, it like, it, it really boils down to being curious about who you're speaking with, showing them re the respect of having done research and, and, you know, knowing about them, knowing enough about them so that wherever the conversation goes, you can follow it. Uh, right. But listening, most people don't listen. 
when they interview people. Most mm. people have a list of questions and they want to get through those list yeah. of questions. When I make up a list of questions, um, if I get past the second one, something's wrong. I always think, you know, uh, the first question for me should lead you somewhere. And then right. you ask a question, but it's all about doing the research uh, to begin with. And it, it, for, for a time, I was doing, you know, 20 or 25 of these a week. And it's hard to do uh, hardcore research when you're doing that many. And, you know, they're only maybe four or five minutes long. It, it, more recently for uh, television and for radio, I've been doing much more and for podcasts, doing much more long form interviews mm -hmm. and, you know, fewer of them and longer form. And you actually get a chance to speak to people and, and find out a little bit about them rather than um, just have them, you know, throw out a couple of tried and true sound bites and then move on right. from there. And, you know, you mentioned, I find this really interesting in terms of, you know, you, you do all this research, you, you, and I've, and I've heard you say this as well, that you, you, as you describe, you know, you get, you just read off the first one and then you let it go. Yeah. Uh, how, how long was it? So you were really able to trust to not look at those questions, you know, how, what, like just to trust that the research is enough and that I'll be able to have follow-ups and so on and so forth. It depends on the, on the situation, you know, right. uh, uh, for me, uh, I, uh, the one, the, the one area in terms of, of doing this that I'm confident in my abilities is, is interviewing people. And so that has come just over the, the, the course of time for real to real, uh, when that ended after 10 years, I think I had done a little over 4,000 interviews for that show. And so you, wow. just, you, you learn over mm. time, you know, you, you, you gather skills and you learn. Um, but you know, there is something about, um, you know, I've hosted press conferences with Brad Pitt and Madonna and people like that. And you want to go in with an arsenal. You want to be ready right. for those because you've got uh, a assembled press from around the world sitting directly in front of you. Yeah. You know, a couple of dozen photographers taking photographs. Most of these were aired live on television as well. And you've got the biggest stars in the world sitting next to you. So you have to be ready for any eventuality. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of the way that I go into these things. There will be a list of questions in front of me, but man, I, I consider it a, a sign of my own uh, failure. To, you know, that's harsh, but uh, if I have to use all the questions that I've written down. I see, I see. Oh, it's failure in terms of, of just if I, I, I haven't brought, that I failed. Well, that I haven't brought out uh, the, the interview subject uh, or that I haven't made them right. feel comfortable enough that they just want to tell me stuff. They just want to talk. I like interviews that are conversations that aren't formal interviews. And, right. you know, they're, they're, it's a fine line, but it, but it, but, but it is a line. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And do you, do you still get nervous? Or um, I, I suppose sometimes I do. Um, you know, there are, there are moments when uh, you want things to go well, um, you know, hosting the press conferences for the Toronto International Film Festival can be pretty nerve wracking when you oh, step, yeah. you know, off the street and into the green room and, you know, you're sitting next to Denzel Washington just before you go on and you know that pretty soon you're going to be in front of a lot of people talking with Denzel and if he's not in a good mood or whoever mm. it might be, uh, you know, you've got your work cut out for you. So uh, yeah, th there's a little twinge of nerves here and there, but if you don't have nerves, I think probably you should, you know, think about that a little bit and think, yeah. why, do, why am I not a little bit more nervous about this? There's something wrong there if you don't. <laughs> I really, uh, I, I'm glad that you suggested another movie to take a look at, The Devils, which you mm -hmm. wrote, the Ken Russell, which you wrote uh, a book on. Why, why is that a film that you recommend? Well, that was a, a, a movie that um, I had seen years ago, and I was able to uh, host an event with Ken Russell uh, here in Toronto at the Bloor Street Cinema. We uh, thought 500 people would show up. We ended up with a lineup down the street. We filled all 900 seats plus, had to turn a bunch of people away to see a movie that very few people realistically have seen because mm. it was uh, uh, banned and censored and cut apart 
uh, from the very moment it was released in 1971. And it was a big studio picture. Ken Russell was a big deal at the time. Uh, he was hired by Warner Brothers to make this movie. And as he kind of describes it, he had this idea for making a, a book out of the, the story uh, that Aldous Huxley had told about these uh, exorcisms and, and possessions that were happening uh, in, in 17th century France. Uh, and they're like, jerk, great, whatever. At that point, the studio system is kind of falling apart. They just want mm, young right. hip directors. He was one of them. So he's in England, and he builds this most amazing set. And he's got big stars, Oliver Reed and, and Vanessa Redgrave, headlining this story. And everything was great until he says, then the boys in Burbank actually read the script. And they were on a plane on the first flight over. Uh, and that's what started the trouble with uh, mm -hmm. the, the devils. And I mean, I can talk for hours about this. I won't, but I spent two and a half years writing a book about it and tracking down the actors and producers and anyone who was there actually on set at the moment. And, and I love the movie. Uh, because it is so transgressive, but it's actually a really beautiful movie about faith, uh, about, uh, that, and, and it's very interesting that so many of the, of the themes that are in the devils were, uh, then brought up again in the exorcist, which came out yeah. shortly afterwards. Two years whereas, later. Yeah. yeah. Whereas the devils had been pilloried and and consigned to the to the junk heap the delete bins of history uh, the exorcist becomes a giant hit and i think that there's a couple of reasons for it i think one of the main ones uh is that ken russell's in your face style i mean there's a sequence in the movie called the rape of christ i mean this right. is a this is a a very heavy hitting movie uh not for the faint of heart but it also and this, I mean, uh, came out in 1971. I don't think this is a spoiler anymore. It it ends on a really bleak note. Oh, where, yeah. Whereas yeah. The Exorcist doesn't. The Exorcist suggests at the end that good can overcome evil. The devil's right. going to do that. So you leave the theater uh, in a very different frame of mind uh, after seeing one or the other of these films. And the devil's... I think holds up beautifully. Uh, Russell was uh, a maximalist, you know, he never met a bit of, you know, uh, gold or, or things that he wouldn't stick in a set somewhere. There's lots of crazy seventies camera work in it, but it's an amazing film. And, and Oliver Reed I mean, is dominating oh, yeah. uh, yeah. as uh, Grandier in this, the, the, the priest who uh, tried to fight against the King. Yeah, I, you know, I, I watched it just yesterday. I hadn't seen it before, uh, and I, I did manage to find it. It's not easy to find. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, just in terms of just, you know, uh, abusing your power and, you know, the, the uh, how, how these people were so repressed as a result of their uh, religion and, and, and beliefs was, was really uh, powerful. And, yeah, I mean, it is shocking. But I couldn't believe how much of it is true. I, I thought I thought a lot of it was dramatized, and then I, I couldn't help but get interested. I Googled it, and yeah. I was like, wow, this is like almost word for word what oh, happened. It, it's, it, you can go down a very deep rabbit hole with the devils, yeah. and, and I did for a long time. It was a tough book to write because most of the actors, um, many of them were gone. Uh, many of them have retired, so just tracking them down was you know a little tricky, but... Um, apart from all that, the subject matter was so dark and I lived with it for, uh, you know, two and a half years, um, that yeah. I was, I was very happy when it was over and I handed the book in that I could sort of lighten things up around here a little bit. <laughs> but, um, but I'll tell you, you know, that movie, uh, stays with me and imagine the power of the original cut, because whatever you saw was not the original cut. It just isn't out there in the world. It, it does exist. It's in a vault, apparently at Warner Brothers somewhere, right. with restored and with uh, Ken Russell's commentary tracks ready to go. They just refuse to release it. But mm. uh, it is uh, an incredible story. And it's a story about uh, nuns who uh, people felt were possessed by the devil. Well, it turns out that maybe one of the things that happened is that they left the wheat in the field for just a little bit too long 
and it got wet and this mold that was not unlike LSD formed on the wheat. Mm. They made bread with it. They yeah. fed it to the nuns and all of a sudden they're acting strangely and they're thinking, yeah. well, 17th century France, that means demonic possession. And right. I mean, it's, it, it's an absolutely incredible story. And one uh, that, as I say, you go down that rabbit hole, you're not going to come up for a while. I was going to ask you about that because just this morning when I got out of the shower, I was telling my wife a little about it. And she was like, oh, I don't want to. Oh, God, I don't want to hear about this. And then I thought, how did Richard sit, write a book for two hours? <laughs> like, just and, to get and that in watch the movie about a hundred times. And, oh, God, you know, yeah. In the original, in the original uh, edition of the book, uh, I did an almost like frame for frame uh, breakdown of the movie. And it took, you know, a month and a bit to mm. write. And um, when I handed it in, the editor just said, it's, it's, it's too much. It's too graphic. It's yeah. too, it's just too much. And, and they were right. And we, we ended up taking the, the information and kind of spreading it out over the book. Uh, but you know, there are, there are scenes in that movie that one scene will not soon be forgotten uh, by anyone. Oh God. Yeah. No, I don't think I, I ever will. <laughs> Uh, Mal uh, hello to a uh, friend of mine, uh, Malcolm Taylor, is asking, uh, where can you find the Devils? I found it on a free internet streaming service uh, through the library called archive.org. They have a lot of old movies for free, and it is, they have both the uncensored and a censored version. Right, and um, even the uncensored version isn't the complete uncensored version. Um, there are scenes right? that were just dismantled and sort of lost for time. So there are people who have tried to recreate those scenes and put them in, but it's not quite uh, the same uh, as mm -hmm. the original cut. You can also find it, the BFI, uh, the British Film Institute, had uh, a pretty good, I mean, a beautiful looking uh, print of it that you could buy on, on DVD, but again, not complete. And that's the holy grail is finding the, right. the version of this film that has everything in it. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely read the book because I'm I'm extremely intrigued by by this whole thing. <laughs> I'm curious, you know, pop uh, your show, a pop life. It reminds me so much of the old Dick Cavett show, which I really really love. Was that an inspiration, or who are some of the people that inspired? you know, the way in which you interview people. Uh, well, Dick Cavett, absolutely. And, yeah. you know, I was a kid when he was a, a big deal on television, but I loved the show and I loved uh, that he would have uh, a variety of people on. It was always somebody yeah. like Gore Vidal and oh. John Lennon and, you know, <laughs> Dorothy Kilgarten, you know, and, yeah, and yeah. he would have these people on. And, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't really know who Gore Vidal was probably or Dorothy Kilgarten, but uh, he would have them on and everyone would stay. That was the kind of cool thing about that show is that people would stay and uh, be part of the conversation. And sometimes it was goofy. Sometimes it was extremely serious. There were fist fights on the show. Um, mm, I loved yeah. that it, it felt like almost anything could happen. Um, one <laughs> guest actually died on the set during the show, had a heart attack, and just passed away. Um, that clip is, is I think, scrubbed from the internet. Yeah. But I loved that show because it, it felt – different than Merv Griffin or, mm. you know, even Johnny Carson and the other shows that were on at the time, because it was, and this is what, you know, I would say about pop life. It's fun, but not frivolous. Yeah. Um, I like, you know, having lively conversations with people. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, if there's a little message woven in and around there somewhere, that's not such a bad thing either. Did you ever have anything like a, a fist fight, like anything Dick Cavett style happen on there? No, <laughs> Any walkouts? <laughs> no, nothing, uh, nothing like that. Uh, <laughs> I've left a couple of interviews, uh, not for Pop Life, but I've left a couple of in-person interviews um, early when I realized like this isn't going anywhere. Mm. And, you know, I've, I've wrapped things up early, pleasantly, you know, yeah. but early and, and just uh, made my way. But I don't have any of those like, the Daniel Richler story about uh, interviewing Lou Reed, where he takes the microphone off and stomps off. I've, I, I do not have that. Is there, is there anyone you can, you can tell us that you walked, that you cut off early or is that in the vault? 
No, it's kind of in the ball. I mean, Jennifer Beals, I'll, I'll say, like, this is the first time I think I ever did it. Um, uh, I would ask her a question. She'd answer a different question. I would uh, oh. ask her a question. She'd ask me a question. And we, we were just talking in circles. And mm. after five or six minutes of what was meant to be a 15-minute interview, I left. And she was perfectly nice. It just it, it just wasn't going anywhere. And uh, there were some, you know, unhappy letters from publicists after that. But, um, right. you know. But did, she was lovely. Did, uh, yeah, because I, I also know, like, Sally Field was professional, you said, but she was, you know, she not, was, not the she, warmest yeah, at first. She, she was professional. I mean, yeah. you know, it's so funny sometimes when you're doing these interviews, and uh, uh, particularly there's there's a few different kinds of these interviews. Like, there are drunken interviews where a studio will fly you somewhere uh, to New York or Los Angeles, and you'll interview the actors involved in a movie, and they're going to do 40 interviews that day, and you're just going to be one of them. And essentially, they're going to be asked the same thing 40 times in a row, right. and they're going to say pretty much the same thing 40 times in a row. Uh, there are those who shake it up a little bit, but by and large, that's how the, the situation works. And I have not done those for a very long time because um, I got tired of being away and coming back with, you know, 10 minutes of, of footage after having flown back and forth to Los Angeles for a weekend uh, that, that I didn't find all that inspiring. Um, mm -hmm. Sally Field was great on camera. She's fine on camera, but you know, as, as uh, you walk in the room, you were just a name on a list because she's right. got 30 of these to do and she wanted to get through them. So very professional Ben Affleck. I remember interviewing him on the deck of some giant aircraft carrier in Hawaii for the movie Pearl Harbor. And, and as we were doing the interview, I couldn't figure out uh, what he was looking at, why he wasn't looking at me because he was looking like this the entire time. And I'm sitting over here and we chatted and the interview was fine. And then you get the footage back and it's beautiful. He knows right. how to use the camera, you know? Right. So um, there's all those kind of little quirky things that happen. I had a very famous producer one time, uh, uh, in a room I came in and his room, his chair was, was elevated. All the chairs in the room were pretty much the same, but his was up on like elevated just a little bit. So he's looking down at you. And then when you, I said, hello, you know, Mr. So-and-so I'm Richard Krauss. And I went to put out my hand to shake his hand and he leaned back in his chair and he just put his hand up like this to force me to get out of my chair and come right. over and shake his hand. And right. You know, that is not a great way to start an interview, but I loved it because it was such a Hollywood power move, so blatant, <laughs> so crass, so, yeah. you know, the kind of thing that you read Louis B. Mayer doing, that sort of thing. I loved it. Right. It felt so old school to me. Yeah, no, I, I bet. I know in, in another uh, interview, you I, I won't say who it was, but I think you spilled who it, once, who it was once, but I, <laughs> I won't say just in case you want to put that in the vault. Yeah, That's a great. Know. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great, great story. Uh, I'm sure something you said, I know we only have a few minutes, uh, something you said that I thought was really interesting uh, when, when you uh, were, uh, were battling the cancer you had was uh, that, you know, it made your life uh, better because then you didn't sweat the small stuff. Yeah. Um, how did you, going through something like that, how did you find a way to be optimistic or find a way to make it a learning experience? I, well, I think that you, you have to figure that out. You have to figure it out yourself. Um, it, it will be different for everybody. For me, uh, at the very beginning of it all, and it was a long process, and there was surgery and a year and a half of chemo, and, and it really turns your life upside down. And I, I wanted to be sure that uh, if, and I feel the same, honestly, feel the same way about the pandemic, if we are going to make these sacrifices now, um, if our lives are going to be turned upside down, you got to learn something from it. You have right. to use this as a learning experience. I am lucky that uh, she wasn't my wife then. She is now. Andrea um, is, you know, optimistic and she looks for the joy in things, which is not always my first reaction. Right. Uh, right. But she does. And it makes a huge difference, uh, particularly in uh, a situation like that, where I knew that for the next year and a half or more, uh, that life was going to be different and that it was going to be out of my control. And one of the things about the pandemic uh, that I think has has made me think about it and 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 compare the two is that 
you know, when you realize that you don't really have control over all the stuff that you thought you had control over, a lot of things just get batted away that you no mm. longer have to really worry about because I can't really do much about that anyway. I don't sweat the small stuff anymore because, you know, uh, I spent too many years doing that uh, right. and it took, you know, cancer and now a pandemic to really uh, make sure that that's drilled into my head. Yeah, no, I, 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 I like that. As hard as it can be, that's a, a good attitude at least to, to attempt to, <laughs> to take into anyone's life. Yeah. Um, I mean, whether it's, you know, hopefully you don't have to go through cancer right. or whatever to, to figure that out. Right. No, no, absolutely. Uh, I know you have to go. Uh, and I, I just wanted to mention, of course, uh, you're in isolation with Richard Krause is on uh, YouTube. Yep. Uh, and because pop life is in, uh, it is not, they're not, you're not able to film now, but you said it's on the radio, right? Eight to nine yeah. on Saturdays. Yeah. On news talk, 10, 10 in Toronto. And then across the country on the bell media, the iHeart media radio network, uh, you can find it there and it's a podcast and it's, that's easy to find. And, uh, right. and we've got some cool people, uh, coming up, Danielle Lenoir, uh, talking about his new album, really fascinating. Uh, you know, after years of producing people like you two and, Peter Gabriel and working with Brian Eno. Uh, uh, he's that making, would be great. Yeah, he's making really yeah. beautiful music on his own now and and uh, and loads of other people. William Shatner's on this week. It's fun. Yeah, no, that sounds like a great episode. Well, Richard, thank you. Thank you so much. I can I can go on and on. I know you're uh, uh, I know you're pressed for time, so I'll let you go. But I really appreciate uh, you joining us today. And for those of you who left uh, comments and questions in the chat box. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if it's your first time on our channel, please consider giving us uh, a sub by clicking the subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. Uh, thanks again. Thanks again, Richard, and we'll see everyone soon. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, thank everybody. You.